So tonight we're going to hear from Kara McManus, and I'm channeling Dick Cavett. We're doing this as a kind of interview format, but I met with Kara about a month ago. I was completely enchanted. I can't say that I didn't know about her. I did know about her because I had had the privilege to see her dance up here a few years ago, and my jaw was on the floor. I thought, that is one remarkable artist. So um, I'm delighted that she's here. She is our local girl done good. <laughs> <laughs> so Kara grew up in Falmouth, and she graduated from Falmouth High School, and she spent almost a decade studying under the direction of Laura Shortino uh, at the Turning Point Dance Studio in North Falmouth. Laura is here with us tonight, and I would just like to give a shout out. Oh. I think it is one of the finest dance schools, and I don't say that lightly, that I um, am familiar with. Um, it's just quite an, an Thank you. incredible. Thank you. attended college in New York City at Fordham, which is associated in its dance degree with the Alvin Ailey School. She graduated summa cum laude in 2015 with a BFA in dance and a BA in comparative literature. She's probably the only dancer I know who holds a second degree in comparative <laughs> literature. <laughs> You'll hear why in a minute. Since her graduation, she has danced and toured with the Martha Graham Dance Company and the Naini Chin Dance Company, as well as engaging in a myriad of smaller dance and film projects at venues as diverse as Jacob's Pillow, Battery Park, the Rockefeller Estate, and the Bosky, Marian Bosky Gallery. So please welcome Kara McManus. <laughs> And we are going to see several clips <coughs> of Kara dancing as well during this uh, interview. So Kara, many dancers uh, say that they knew at an early age that they were quote unquote born to dance. And I wanted to know, is that true with you? That is not true with <laughs> me. Um, yeah, I've definitely heard many peers bring out the story of, oh, I went to see a performance when I was five and I I just knew that was my future. Um, but I think for me, continuing in dance was never so much a trying to reach a specific goal in the future thing as it was a I can't let go of dance in my life thing. Like it was more of a looking at my past in dance and realizing I couldn't let go of that. Um, so I, never, I don't think I even decided to go to college for dance until later on in high school when I suddenly realized, like, I can't stop dancing. <laughs> I need to dance in college. And honestly, the same thing after college as well. Um, as you mentioned, I have a second degree, so I wasn't just doing dance in college. So there still were options in front of me as I graduated. But again, I realized I can't stop dancing. So it wasn't so much a going toward as a can't leave behind. <laughs> How old were you when you started at Turning Point? I was at Turning Point from its inception I want to say uh, 19, uh, 2003 or 4, 2003 or 4, Laura knows better than I do, 2003, yeah, so before that I studied at, um, with Irene Merrill at the conservatory, and then moved over to Laura and Turning Point, and I was there throughout high school. So you, you started as a young child, though, yes, with dance. Yes, yeah. I did. Well, the, the emphasis at Laura's school is on classical ballet. Um, at what point in the training there were you introduced to modern dance? Because obviously you made a decision to go into modern dance right. professionally. Yeah. Um, well, these days there's a lot going on at Turning Point, which is amazing. But back when I was there, it was mainly a ballet school. Um, I was never a ballerina. <laughs> I think everyone who saw me dance growing up knows that. Um, definitely wasn't born with the body for it or anything like that. Um, I think the first time I ever experienced anything outside of ballet was um, when I was 15 or 16. I went away to my first summer intensive, which is like a way to get extra 
dance training during the summers um, when the studio is kind of off for the summer. So I went to the Virginia School of the Arts. Um, there was some modern classes there as well as things like West African and hip hop, which um, I can't say I'm very good at. <laughs> but those modern classes were really kind of a wake up call to me as like seeing a wider world of dance instead of just classical ballet. Um, it opened up more options for just exploring movement. Um, and I think that felt good on my body. Moving always felt good on my body, not so much the shapes of classical ballet. So yeah, sort of being introduced to modern around 15 and 16, and then the studio as I was advancing in high school opened up a little. We got in some modern teachers and some contemporary classes, and one thing led to another. So this first video clip that we're going to see, mm -hmm. is that um, a recital of Laura's at Turning Point? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's Laura's choreography. Oh, it's Laura's choreography. It's and really good. Okay. It's, <laughs> yeah. How old are you in this uh, clip that we're going to see? Um, it's the end of my junior year of high school, so I think I was almost 17, 16 or 17. And, the, and there are other people on the stage, so Laura is going to say, that's me, that's me, to help you out a little bit. So we're going to go to our first video clip. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Margaret, can I turn on these overhead lights? Um, yeah. Thank you, Margaret. Laura in the front in the green. ballet privates at the Graham Teen Summer Intensive in the next few weeks, and they want me to work on her point work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I have long since shed them, but they will soon be coming back in a different form. Wow. <laughs> Somehow. That's new for the Graham School, isn't it, to be teaching point work? Uh, last five or so years, I really? would say, yeah. They introduced ballet. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Well, many Graham dancers always took ballet class yes. in addition to, to Graham. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you went to Falmouth High School, yes. and I understand that you were a very good student, and uh, your interests there, I was curious, what were your interests, uh, not only academically, but also extracurricularly, and did any of those interests, by any chance, conflict with your dance training? <laughs> the answer is a big yes, on all counts. Um, in high school, I actually played varsity soccer. Um, I made the team my freshman year, which was big for me. Um, I'm the oldest of three, so I had no sort of point of reference as to what high school was like, what high school sports were like. So all of a sudden, I like made varsity soccer, um, and it was this huge time commitment. And I realized, like, I couldn't dance during the soccer season, um, so I pretty much gave up a lot of 
dance opportunities during those falls of soccer, um, which was a big loss. And I realized that more and more as high school went on. So my senior year of high school, I actually made the decision to quit soccer um, and focus on getting ready for college dance auditions. Um, my soccer coach was not very happy about it. <laughs> and one of the reasons I gave him was that um, I couldn't injure myself right before these college dance auditions. <laughs> and then what did I do? I went into a nutcracker rehearsal and broke my elbow. <laughs> um, he has not let me live that down to this day. <laughs> Every time he sees me, he's like, how's the elbow doing? Um, but he's a great guy, really. But yeah, so soccer was a huge conflict. And again, going back to the whole not born to dance thing, um, I definitely was involved in a lot growing up beyond dance. Um, I did model United Nations Club, as well as soccer. And of course, academics were always a big focal point of my upbringing. Yeah, yeah. You, you told me that not going to college was never an option right. for you, that not only did you want to go, but your parents were fairly <coughs> resistant that yes. you go to college. So where did you apply and why? Uh, yeah, so I applied to a good amount of places. Um, most of them did have dance programs, but they weren't all high-profile dance programs, like the Fort Amelie School. Um, some of them were, I mean, I applied to Duke University and Wake Forest University down south, which just had these small fledgling dance programs. Um, so I definitely wanted dance in college, but I wasn't sure if I was going to go the more conservatory style route or like the fledgling, fledgling dance program route. Um, and at the end of the day, it did come down to <coughs> the Fordham Ailey program in New York City and Duke University down south. Um, there were points when I knew that my dad especially really wanted me to go to Duke, but for me it was always going to be Fordham because, I don't know, something about just this perfect balance of dance and academics um, really drew me. Um, I think, like talking about my childhood, I realized like I always kind of wanted to have it all. Like I wanted to play soccer and dance and do all the academic stuff. So that was a really big draw for me in choosing Fordham Ailey as my college experience. Everything. I, I think that most people don't realize that there are about 250 accredited college dance degree programs in the United States. There are many more that are not full degree programs, but uh, those programs are extremely demanding. They give you a BFA or a BA in dance, which require an enormous amount of hours, way more. So. For instance, as a college student, you might go to your algebra class or your English class twice a week, each time for an hour, an hour and a half. When you're a dance major, you take more than one dance class, usually an hour and a half, sometimes two hours every day, and along with all your other subjects, and you're in rehearsal at night, and you're expected to do your academics. It's very unusual that someone is smart enough to complete a double degree at the same time we tended always to discourage that at our university because it was ma major problems with burnout if that happened. So um, why don't you tell us what an average day was like for you at Fordham? Yeah, they did actually discourage me from doing the double degree. Um, it was like a huge audition process to even get in. Um, like I had to go to New York City, there was like a ballet class, a modern class, you presented a solo, you had an interview, um, and then you also had to get accepted by Fordham. And so after all that happened, I was like, wow, I actually did it, I can do academics and dance. And then I had dance advisors telling me, um, we really discourage you from doing a double degree because it's just so time consuming. Um, they're like a lot of students in the dance program get their dance degree and then minor in something else, but I really, really wanted the double degree. Um, however, those students who did go the double degree route would get a BFA in dance and a BFA in their second major, um, which wasn't even enough for me. I really wanted a BFA in dance and a BA in my second major. So I did this really crazy thing that I actually don't know anyone else um, around my time there did that 
I took the entire core of Fordham University's classes and all of the requirements for both majors. Normally, <coughs> dancers who double major are going to take an abbreviated core at Fordham and then all of their major requirements, and that's how they get the BFA in two degrees. Um, but I really wanted the separate degrees. So I took an entire core at Fordham, all the requirements for two majors, and what that meant was I started classes at 8.30 in the morning and ended at 10.30 p.m. every night. Um, it was crazy. <laughs> I still don't know how I did it or how I survived, but um, what made it worse is that Fordham and the Ailey School are about five blocks apart in New York City. So I live in the dorms at Fordham. I have my first class at Ailey at 8.30 a.m., so I run down there. My second class at 10 is at Fordham. So I run back the five blocks to Fordham. Third class is a dance class again. Run five blocks back to Ailey. <laughs> Maybe like an hour to lunch break. Um, and then some rehearsal at Ailey. And then a three hour night class at Fordham. And then run back to Ailey for the night rehearsals that end at 10.30 p.m. Um, it was an insane schedule. But I mean, you have, I think there was somewhere between 25 and 30 of us in the class. And we were all in it together, so it was great to just have this. I mean, we were a community, um, and we could support each other in that crazy schedule, and that really helped get through it. Yeah. And that, that wasn't all she was doing during that time, and we're going to talk about that <laughs> in a minute, and you will uh, be amazed. So as, uh, what do you think was the most difficult aspect for you uh, during that time in the dance program, and what were some of the highlights? Right, so the time management was definitely difficult. Um, obviously fitting in homework on top of all of that. Um, there are definitely some essays I could have written better. <laughs> but um, I think besides that, one of the biggest challenges was dealing with the institution of Alvin Ailey. Um, they're a very political institution as far as the school goes. Um, you know, you've got a bunch of students there who have been doing summer intensives at the Ailey School their whole life. So they're like already ingrained into the system, everyone knows them. But for those of us that were just coming in, it was really hard to sort of like work your way in and get opportunities that are only offered to students who have been around and are known and are really good at making connections, which was definitely not me. Um, I've never been great at, you know, like putting myself out there and making the connections. So that was really difficult to deal with, navigating the sort of political structure there. Um, but one of the biggest highlights was the teachers at the Haley School. I mean, they're some of the best dancers and teachers in the world. And it was all so worth it just to get to work with them. I still keep in touch with some of them today. Like, um, I mean, you already mentioned that I was with the Graham Company. So some of my Graham teachers at Haley, um, I actually hated Graham classes at Ailey, which I can get into more later, but the Graham teachers themselves were just these amazing, vivid people that I just never met any dancers like that before, and just to be able to work with them and make those connections was amazing. Yeah, it was a highlight for sure. So, uh, you, you clearly you had an affinity for the Graham technique, right? You, no, you didn't. Oh. <laughs> no, all right. But as graduation drew near, you yeah. realized that it was time to think about trying to get a job with a dance company, yes. right? So um, how did you go about that? Right. So, I mean, things did not slow down senior year. If anything, they were like picking up, especially all the dance stuff. So I would say as I went into my last semester as a senior, um, I wasn't really even stopping to think about after college at that point. I was just trying to get through the semester, and we had some amazing opportunities that semester. Um, all the seniors are required to find someone to choreograph a senior solo on them. And I actually reached out to Gretchen here. Um, Laura put us in contact. And you suggested your student, Jermaine Terry, who currently dances and then danced with the Ailey Company. Um, would be willing to choreograph something on me. So I was working with Jermaine that semester, and he was setting a piece he had choreographed in the past on me. Um, and that was a really eye-opening process for me in terms of um, discovering maybe what 
really attracted me to dance at the end of the day as all of this was coming to a close. Like, what was going to carry me forward in dance? He was setting more of like a dance theater piece on me, which wasn't really something I'd ever done before. A lot of the stuff at Ailey was, I mean, you had your classes, which were strict dance techniques. But then a lot of the choreography we, we did was very contemporary and edgy. Um, but Jermaine was setting a very modern dance theater piece on me. And another thing that was happening during that final semester was um, our senior class got to learn a gram piece, a gram repertory piece, um, Acts of Light, which was choreographed by Martha sometime around the 80s, I think. And that was really eye-opening to me as well, because I've been having these gram classes throughout college. It's a requirement at the Ailey School that you take gram classes. But, I mean, it never seemed right to me. Like, I didn't feel like my body was made for it. Scram is a very dramatic technique. Um, and it just wasn't me, psychologically speaking. Um, but working with Jermaine and learning this Scram repertory, and like, all of a sudden something opened up, and I was like, oh, wow. Like, the possibilities for expression and all of this are amazing. It's not just me sitting in a classroom anymore. It's like me as a person. Um, so as I headed into the very end of that year, all of this stuff starting to like come out from inside me, um, I ended up going to the Graham audition, which was not something I had planned on. And I'd gone to a couple auditions so far, and nothing was really panning out, but I also wasn't that drawn to anything yet. Um, definitely still figuring everything out, and I think maybe this is going to lead into your next question. Which is, uh, yeah, tell us about your audition for the Margaret yeah. Graham company. Can everybody hear uh, Kara? Good. No. No. All right. Yeah, maybe, should she hold the mic up a little closer to her hair? Maybe, I don't know. Hair. I don't know. You can move it up a little closer, maybe. You can also just speak louder. There you go. Okay, That's great. Better. Um, so yeah, so the Graham Company audition, the end of my senior year. Um, I wasn't really planning on going, like I wasn't dead set on the Graham Company yet, but my friend was, and she convinced me to go along with her one weekend. Um, I was like, oh, you know, another audition opportunity, a little audition experience, sure, I'll go. I have this huge final paper due on Monday, but I'll go. I'll get cut off for the first round. Um, so yeah, I went to the audition Saturday morning, made it through the first round and the second round, and I was thinking, wow, this is like amazing. I never expected that being surrounded by people who were invested in this sort of dramatic dance expression, it changes the way that you dance that dramatic dance expression. It's like, um, it's okay if that makes any sense. Um, but yeah, I made it to the end of that day. They invited me back to the callbacks on Sunday. Um, so I got home and I was like overwhelmed with the experience. It was so amazing, but at the same time a little panicked because now I had this huge paper to write <laughs> due on Monday. Um, I had lost my whole Saturday. But instead I spent the whole night um, Googling the Graham Company and <laughs> watching videos of all their rep. Um, went back on Sunday made it almost to the end, and then they talked to me and they said, um, you know, come back to the Graham 2 audition, which is Graham's second company, um, which will be in a couple weeks, um, which was basically the best I could have hoped for, given that, you know, I didn't have enough experience in Graham. Um, but yeah, so I went home that Sunday night and emailed my professor and was like, I've never asked for an extension before. Can I please have an extension <laughs> on my essay? And thankfully, he was actually a dance advisor, so he got it. He was like, okay, I'll give you the extension. But that was the first audition experience I had where I was just like, wow, I have to have this. Like, this is dance now. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, I went back to the Grand 2 audition and got a contract. So, Grand 2. <laughs> Graham 2 is the second company for Martha Graham, and um, as you may know, many dance companies, and almost all ballet companies in the United States now, have what they call a second company. And primarily, these companies serve two purposes. Uh,
first they function as a way for the company's directors to kind of have a quote unquote audition for one or two years <laughs> with a young dancer uh, to see how they are as a performer to evaluate their stage presence and they're also able to discover whether or not a dancer is prone to injury, uh, uh, see what their work ethic is, uh, see how well they function as a member of a group, and all of those things are very important considerations before you offer one of those prized full-time contracts uh, into a professional company. So having a second company uh, also gives the main company an inexpensive access to additional dancers who they may need in larger work. So almost every ballet company in America, for instance, uh, uses members of their second company to augment their uh, cast in large cast works like the Nutcracker or Swan Lake, and they pay them a pittance in comparison to what they pay their full-time dancers. But everybody goes, well, it's kind of my two-year audition. And that's usually the time in, it, in the one or two years that you spend in a second company. Uh, if you're not invited into the main company at the end of that time, you're just sort of waved goodbye to and you can put it on your resume. But uh, uh, dancers line up to get into second companies because that really is the entree into the main company. So tell us about your experience in the Graham second company. Did we want to watch my college video first? Yes, we yeah. do want to watch your college video first. I forgot. Yeah. Um, so the fr it's three clips. The first clip is going to be a rehearsal of like a contemporary piece. Um, the second clip is that senior solo I was talking about on stage. And then the third clip is that first contemporary piece on stage. Just, just a little primer.
Dance program, you do lots of um, performances. You perform faculty works, you perform works that the dance program brings in by guest choreographers, and you study choreography yourself. Yep. So you learn to choreograph. So mm -hmm. Jermaine, who choreographed the middle piece there, uh, I thought when he was my student at <coughs> University of South Florida, was enormously talented as a choreographer. He went on and he's still dancing with Ailey, you know, more than 10 years now. And uh, he has kept up his choreography by doing solos for people that have requested them. He never wanted to um, pursue it as a profession. I was very disappointed because I don't <laughs> think great choreographers grow on trees and I thought he was very talented. He decided to go in a different direction to augment uh, his dance career. He's a costume designer and mm -hmm. getting quite a reputation as a costume designer. He designed that costume. Yeah, he designed that he costume. Repeats, and yeah. all the way through school, he was designing costumes and sewing them on a sewing machine at night as well. So, and I always encouraged it because I think everybody that's a dancer has to think about career number two because the dance career is not something that goes on forever. You better have a backup plan because you never know when injury is going to stop your career or some other thing, too, so you have to think about it. Yeah. So um, we'll get back to what your second career is in a minute. Uh, so you were always hoping, of course, for a, com for a contract with a main company, right? You were with the second company. So um, tell us about, you went to an audition for the main company while you were in the second company, have I got that right? Yes. Yes. So tell us what happened at that sure. audition. Sure. Let me talk a little bit about Grand 2 first. Yes. And please. then I'll get into the next audition. Um, so Grand 2 <coughs> was the contract with Grand's second company that I had after finishing college. Um, <coughs> Grand 2 is interesting because you're only paid for performances. So you're basically rehearsing for free. And it's uh, four or five days a week of rehearsal. Um, so it's a lot. And there was maybe 10 of us, 10 people in the second company, um, somewhere between 8 and 10. And we did a variety of different performances. Um, the main thing being what we called lecture demonstrations, which were mini performances in a bunch of schools around New York City. Um, so we were required by that whole lecture demonstration program to hit all five boroughs um, twice a year. So there's a section of them in the fall and a section of them in the spring. Um, and we would just perform little excerpts from all of Graham's works. Um, so I got to learn like a, quite a large variety of her choreography during that time, which was really great. And then um, every year we would have a New York season in the spring um, where we would perform like full grand ballets as well as bringing in one or two new choreographers to create new works on us. Um, Grim 2 was difficult not only because of the low pay but also because um, they treat you like you're in the main company in that the grand tradition is very old school. Um, and they still treat it as such. So you're being asked to do some pretty impossible things, both like schedule-wise and physically, mentally, everything. There's a lot of pressure put on you from those in positions of power in the second company um, to perform and to live up to the standards that the grand company has set over the past 93 years now. <laughs> crazy amount of time. Um, so there were some very difficult moments in Grimm too where you're really being pushed to your limits mentally and physically. Um, but her work is just so incredibly deep and rewarding to learn and perform that it makes it all worth it for sure. Um, do you want to watch the Grimm 2 video now or after the audition? Um, I, I think question. I would like to see it now. Uh, I'm not trying to be personal, but tell them what you were paid as a member of the Grand sure. Company. Yeah, um, so nothing for rehearsals and every performance, depending on whether it was like a lecture demonstration or 
like if we went on tour upstate or something, it was a bit of a bigger performance. It was somewhere between fifty and hundred dollars per performance. That was it. Yeah. And you take company class every day. You have somewhere between three and five hours of rehearsal every day. It's, yeah. One of which is paid time. All right. the performance is paid time. And that's pretty <coughs> consistent throughout second companies all over the country. But, yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're going to look at you <laughs> in the second company. Right. And you're going to tell us what we're seeing. Right? Yes. So okay. there's um, three clips in this video. The first one is my first lead role um, in a grand ballet. It's the last piece she ever choreographed in 1991. Um, it's called Maple Leaf Rag, so it's to Scott Joplin's music. Um, the second clip is going to be, well, the second clip is really interesting. It's a rehearsal video of the woman's solo from Plane of Prayer, which is a piece she choreographed in the 80s. Um, that was her, like, grandiose ornamental period, so it's a very grandiose piece, but getting to do that piece was really interesting because it's actually never been revived in the company, um, so all I had to go off of when I was learning this role were old videos from the 80s. Um, there was nothing newer that I could learn from or no current company members, current first company members who could help me learn this role. Um, I was just watching a blurry old video. So that was really interesting to reconstruct because in Graham there's like very specific hand movements and gestures. Everything is very sculptural. So not being able to see all those details on the video or not having someone be able to tell me exactly what all those details were was a very difficult process. But um, the Graham 2 company director, Virginie Messen, worked with me a lot on it. So that was really cool. And then the last <coughs> excerpt in this clip is going to be um, the first thing that Graham ever danced, it's actually not choreographed by her, it was choreographed on her. It's a solo called Serenata Mariska, so it was choreographed by Ted Shawn back in like the early 1900s, I want to say like 1920s, maybe even earlier. Um, but that solo is very interesting because, and you'll see it's a rehearsal video, but I'm wearing the costume, and it's this very elaborate skirt um, that's weighted, so there's actually weights in the bottom of the skirt. And that makes using the skirt all the more difficult because you have to learn the precise place to grab the skirt so that you can manipulate it as the dance requires. Um, so yeah, three very different excerpts. <laughs> Hopefully you'll enjoy them. You might have to turn the volume up for this. And that bench is great because it's very rickety. <laughs> rickety. Yeah. That character, that's all she does in the ballet about seven different times. Because there's a very famous photo of Martha Graham whipping her skirt like that. It's become an iconic photo. <coughs> some stories about the creation of this ballet that are really interesting. <laughs> like she would be very upset with them and their reaction to that was just to bang something out and then of course she says, I like it that way, keep it. So everything's <laughs> kind of like banged out. <laughs> These are all of your <coughs> colleagues in the second company. Yes. Everybody hoping to get a contract with the first company, right? Yes. yes. Actually, when I was performing this piece with the first company, the bench broke. Oh. <laughs> Which was great. Because they used the same props for like decades and decades. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's very old. <laughs> This is Plane of Prayer, a little rehearsal video. This is Sarah Nata Mariska. Um, there's going to be a guy who walks through the video, just ignore him. <laughs> so this is the weighted skirt? Yes. Ted Sean created this for one of the grand yes. when she was very young. Yes. And it's been gramified over the years. So at its creation it was a lot less like muscular and sculptural than it is now. But gram dancers over the decades have really made it their own. every spring mm -hmm. so this was after having been with the second company for a full season from September to this must have been the end of March or no the end of April uh, yeah so I went back to the first company audition and required to go every year if you want to get into the company um, and it was a like I thought the first time I auditioned for the company was wild <laughs> this was even more wild um, I made it to the end of the first day and my name was not called to come back on Sunday for the callbacks. And I was pretty devastated. I was thinking, well, what am I doing here if this isn't going to lead to something, you know? Um, I had a really rough night. <laughs> and then I woke up the next morning to an email from the first company's artistic director. Her name is Janet Aylber, basically saying, I'm so sorry for not calling you back today. It was an oversight. Um, we are considering you for a position with the first company. Um, we just figured we'd see you around, kind of thing. <laughs> and I was like, what <laughs> are you doing to me? I went from thinking my world was over to maybe having a contract. Um, so yeah, that was a wild weekend. And um, the following season, I started apprenticing with the first company. Um, I was continuing to dance with Graham to that second year. Um, and on top of that was dancing and performing with the first company. Uh, so yeah, a year in, and I was all of a sudden with the Martha Graham Dance Company. A dream come true. Yeah. So um, you were only actually employed mm -hmm. part time, and that yes. had to do with very elaborate union contracts, um, which I don't think we have time to get into, but they actually specify how many performances a week you do and what level you are in a company and what your pay scale is. Um, but you, of course, were suddenly being paid much more than you had been paid in the second company. 
Yeah. Right? Can, you, can you again give us an idea what a dancer in the Martha Graham Dance Company on a, right. a full-time contract or even a part-time contract like you have is yeah. paid? Um, so yeah, so the Graham Company is a union company, which is pretty new in the dance world. I'd say the past few decades, all the big companies have been unionizing, which is great on many levels. Um, you don't get mistreated, which is amazing. Um, well, to a certain extent, still the dance world, I mean, come on. Um, but being a union company means that everything that the Martha Graham Dance Company does structurally um, is part of their union contract. So the amount of full-time contracts they have to offer their dancers is part of their union contract. Um, when I joined, all of the full-time contracts were already full. So I was on a part-time contract, um, which meant that they could pretty much decide exactly which days I would work and exactly which performances I would perform in. Whereas, as a full-time contracted member of the company, you are required to be given a certain amount of weeks of work throughout the year. Um, I think they're up to 35 weeks, which is pretty good for a dance company. Um, but on my part-time contract, the pay was interesting because if I worked three or less days a week, they would pay me daily salary, which when I started as an apprentice was, I want to say, 90 something dollars a day. Um, and I know, right? <laughs> I don't think it's a lot, but for a dance company, it was actually a lot. Um, and when I left the company, it had grown over the years to be almost $200 a day, I think. However, if they contracted me for four or more days a week, they were required to pay me a weekly salary instead, which when I started as an apprentice was 800-ish, and upon leaving was closer to 1,000. So that's a huge difference mm -hmm. um, if they contract me three or less days of the week versus four or more days of the week. Um, so as you can imagine, they endeavor as often as possible to do the daily thing. But of course, when you come to like a performance week or the week before the performance, I got that full weekly salary, which close to a thousand dollars a week for a dance company is pretty good. Um, yeah. Well, after you've been just being paid fifty dollars for a performance here right. and there, it seems like heaven. I know. Yeah. And just to give you a little perspective on this, there are in the Martha Graham Dance Company, there are eighteen dancers in the company, and they're of different ranks. Fourteen of them are on full-time contracts, and four of them are on part-time contracts. So this gives you an idea of the talent of this young lady, because every modern dancer practically <laughs> in the world would like to be a member of the Martha Graham Dance Company. Can you explain about unique. collecting unemployment, how many weeks, and what <laughs> there, there is a standard for a dance yeah. company. If you can work, if you can give your dancers 36 weeks a year, I believe it's 36, then they are eligible for unemployment at the end of the year. So this is a huge thing. So if you work 30, I believe it's 36, am I right, Britt? I don't know what it is yeah, now. Yeah. But no. that means that as a dancer, then when you have your layoff periods, you can go and collect unemployment, which used to be about $280 a week, I'm not sure what it is now. But that is the standard for a dancer of success in America. Well, it, it also may, makes it possible to live. Yeah. I mean, well, I that's what I was getting. That's what I'm saying, yeah. financial, that is the standard for financial success in America. So if you think about that, you know, how, <laughs> how, how many professions um, can ask this of their people. So the dance world really runs on the backs of their talent. Yeah, they do. And if, for me, personally, I thought the day I don't have to stand in the unemployment line, <laughs> I will consider myself a success. <laughs> I mean, I, I found that a humiliating experience. But without it, it wouldn't have been possible to pay my rent or anything. You know, it, you get it. average is about a 36-week contract in a dance company. There are very, very few companies like New York City Ballet who pay their dancers all year round. It might really be the only one. Even American Ballet Theater doesn't have a year-round contract. They're still under uh, you know, a certain number of weeks a year. And certainly any of the 
regional dance companies um, are not paying dancers for a full year's work. In Europe, very different. Not only do you get the full year's work, but you get paid vacations, just like everybody else. It's a regular <laughs> work in, what? in Europe. It's a re regular job. It's a regular like job. job. Right. Only in this country is it yeah. slave labor. But anyway, um, you had a first performance at the Joyce Theater with, uh, with the Graham Company. Would you like to talk about that? Sure. Uh, so yeah, my first performance of the company was at the Joyce Theater. Um, we were performing Martha Graham's Primitive Mysteries, which is one of her earliest works from the 1930s. Very, very special work. Um, some of the first reviews it got upon premiering in the 30s were that it was like a religious experience. Um, so it's so special that the company only revives it, I would say, at least every 30 years, um, mm -hmm. if not longer. So when we were learning it, this was back in... 2016, 2017, none of the dancers in the company had ever performed it before. Um, so we were all really learning it together off of videos. Um, they gave us three different videos to watch, one from the 60s, one from the 80s, and one from somewhere around 2000. Um, and that was really interesting because our rehearsal director, Denise Vale, was determined to go back to the earliest version to the 60s, or the earliest recorded version. Um, so it was a really interesting process to see how the technique had developed over the past, what is that, 50 plus years, and sort of reconcile that with dancer's technique today, um, which is so different, of course. Um, so like trying to insert myself into the company as well as pick up on all of this 50 plus years worth of history of this piece all at the same time was um, a really emotional experience for me. Um, I would leave some rehearsals and just get on the subway to go to work just and start crying, not because anything bad necessarily happened, but just because it was just this overwhelming experience in history. Um, and we actually had an author, I think his name was Neil Baldwin, sitting in on the rehearsal process, and he wrote um, at least an essay, and I think he's planning to turn it into a book at some point, on watching that rehearsal process. Um, and you can find it, actually, if you go to the Martha Graham Google, Google Arts and Culture website. There's a Primitive Mysteries section, and his article is included there. Um, and one of the things he wrote in the article was that our rehearsal director, Denise Vail, sort of had us evince the dance from nothing. Um, it wasn't something that you could learn the steps and then put in like the heart and the poetry. It was something that really, it all had to come together. Like the heart, the poetry, the steps, everything had to come at the same time and that was the only way that the piece would have the impact it needed to have. Um, so this was all very new to me, this way of working and Again, very overwhelming experience, but when we finally got it onto the Joyce Theater stage, it was so special and rewarding. Um, and that first performance of the Joyce Theater was actually the gala day, so I had to go on stage, perform this piece for the first time, and then go to my first Graham Gala and mm -hmm. be in a really fancy dress and talk to all these people I'd never met before who were donating so much money to the company, and it was just all amazing. Yeah. My first Joyce Theater experience. All right, let's look at the video. Yes. Primitive Mysteries. Uh, I actually don't have a video of Primitive Mysteries, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, no. I know. All of the Graham stuff is very copyrighted, so I could not get a video of that. But this is going to be a video of... Um, Primitive Mysteries is all women, by the way. So this is another Graham piece that is all women. It's called Chronicle. Very powerful piece. Eleven women. Um, choreographed in the 1940s, I think, as um, Martha Graham's response to turning down Hitler's invitation to perform at the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games in Berlin. Um, so it's in three sections, and I think I have excerpts from the second and third section in here. The first two are going to be rehearsal videos, and then we're going to transition into some stage videos.
makes everything so different. <laughs> Changing tempos and everything.
decision to the complicated movements that are going on in the stage. So right. Let's think about it. Yeah. yeah. Probably wow. some changes had to be made wow. choreographically, yeah. I would say, to adapt to the score. Definitely. And the original yeah. piece was actually five sections long, but only three are performed these days. And Graham was not alive, I take it, when that was done? No, she was alive she during was. the reconstruction. So it was all right yes. with her that the music yeah. was changed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, Martha Graham is generally referred to as the mother of American modern dance. And hers was the first codified <coughs> technique of modern dance, uh, and the first school that taught a very specific technique, like we have a Vaganova technique in ballet or a Balanchine technique. Martha Graham has a very specific technique. And it's taught in a lot of ballet schools. The Paris Opera Ballet has embraced the Graham technique as their modern dance technique for many years. Uh, so, uh, you toured internationally with Graham, and you wanted to talk about yeah. that, right? About touring, yes. yes. It's such a special experience. Um, I did a couple international tours and a lot of national tours. Um, the first international tour I did was wild because um, I actually got called in at the last minute. So this was, um, the rest of the company was on tour in Spain and this was while I was apprenticing. So I was staying back in New York. But then um, I got a call from the company manager and she basically said, someone's injured, we're flying you out to Spain tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I've never performed either of the pieces you want me to perform before, but sure, I will watch some videos, get mm -hmm. ready, perform in Spain in two days. Um, and what made it even worse was that I finally got to the airport on my own, ready to go out there, and my flight was canceled. Um, I was crying in the airport, and I was like, I don't know what to do. The company manager is asleep. It's 3 a.m. in Spain. Um, but I eventually got it worked out, got on a flight the next day and pretty much hopped off the plane and onto the stage at that point, um, which was crazy, but I will always value that experience. Um, but then, yeah, later on, I went on um, a month-long tour to Europe and Canada with the company, which was the longest I've ever toured for, a full month. Um, and it really forces you to find something grounding because, I mean, you're away from all of your natural environments and um, all of your daily routines, etc. Um, so what I found was that having company class on stage every day really grounded me. I was able to, you know, like I had my spot in the corner and I would sit there every morning and really just had to find something to tether me um, to the experience. Um, but yeah, it's a really special thing to be doing because, I mean, you're sort of imbibing so much as you go, rather than when you're at home, I guess I would say you're sort of on autopilot. Like, we had New York seasons every year at, you know, the Joyce Theater and New York City Center, and of course those are really special too, but, I mean, I go through the first half of my day on autopilot, and then I get to the theater and it's performance time, but when you're on tour, like, the whole tour is a performance, basically. Um, it's a really, really special thing to be touring, yeah. And all sorts of unexpected things, right? As yeah. far as the theater and the stage and right, yeah. everything. Like, I mean, language. some stages are raked. Yeah, some New places food. you have no idea what the language is. Um, everything is just, it's like, it's almost like performing to live music. Like I was pointing out in that video, there was one clip that was to live music. And when you're performing to live music, I mean, it's you have to be so in the moment and ready to adjust to anything because you never know what's going to happen and it's kind of the same way being on tour. I mean, you have to be ready for anything. You're constantly alert. Um, there was once when we almost missed our plane because the airport ended up being much larger than we thought. So we were literally running through the airport like, hold the plane, hold the plane. Um, and it turned out to be this tiny little plane that was going to somewhere in Arizona. So we were literally the only people on the plane. So of course they had to hold them. <laughs> all 20 of the 25 people that are taking the flight are not there. Um, but yeah, just got to be ready for anything. So um, as with most dancers, yeah. uh, especially modern dancers in New York City, you've always had a second job in order <laughs> to make ends meet. So what was yours and when did you begin this second job? Um, yeah, so I work in a bookstore. 
<laughs> uh, I have worked there since I graduated from college in 2015. Um, it's called Book Culture, and it's up near Columbia University, Morningside Heights area. Um, and I'm very lucky that they allow me to be as flexible as I need to be with my hours. Like when I went on that month-long tour, they were just like, okay, see you in a month. <laughs> um, which was pretty amazing, but I did have to work my butt off to get to that point with them. Um, because you started as I what? Started as a clerk in the As a bookseller, yeah. As a bookseller, and you are now? And I'm now a book buyer. So I, um, I buy all of the remainders for the store. Remainders are like leftover quantities of books that a publisher has um, that they sell off to wholesale companies at really low prices, and then I buy from the wholesale companies at slightly higher prices, and then sell in the bookstore at still low, but a little bit higher prices. Um, so I'm in charge of remainders for three of the four book culture locations, um, which allows me to, I mean, you know, I can like be creative and have responsibility, um, but still have really flexible hours and not be tied down to, you know, like a register's position or something. So I really, really enjoy working there and I'm not like dying to give it up or anything. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So um, recently, uh, you have made a big decision about yes. where to dance. Would you like to talk to us about that? Yes. Um, so as much as I love the Graham Technique, the Graham Company, the Graham Repertory, everything about it, I decided to leave the Graham Company this spring. Um, I mentioned that when I joined, all of the full-time contracts were already filled. And that has not changed in the past three and a half, four years. No women have left the company. Um, so it's at the point where I can continue to stay and just perform the same pieces over and over again or um, on that part-time contract or kind of get out and have more dance experiences. So last fall, I actually auditioned for the Nine Chen Dance Company, um, which is a smaller dance company in New York City um, run by Nine Chen. She's a dancer from Taiwan, um, and she actually trained in modern dances and the Graham Technique and I think maybe some Cunningham Technique when she was growing up in Taiwan. Um, but then she became you know, a Chinese classical dancer and moved to America and created this sort of fusion of her modern dance training with her classical Chinese dance training. Um, and she really wanted to express um, the her immigration process through those outlets. So it's really some beautiful dancing in that company um, where I can use all of my modern training and my love for modern dance, but also sort of explore the um, Chinese traditional dance aesthetic. And so yeah, I auditioned last fall and she offered me a part-time contract with her company for this past year. Um, so this past year I actually danced part-time for both the Graham Company and the 9010 Dance Company. Um, and it was amazing that it somehow worked, but I was able to give her, at the beginning of the year, the exact dates that I would be contracted with Graham, because Graham gives you a day-by-day -day schedule for your entire year. Um, so we were able to find some dates that worked for Nine, and I was able to do both. But this coming year, that's I already know that would not be a possibility. Um, there's too many conflicting you know, tour dates, and. At this point, I know certain pieces in Nynaeve's repertory that, you know, I can't pick and choose anymore. She can't pick and choose what to give me. I have to be able to do the repertory and the programs that I already know. Um, so I made the decision to dance full time with the 9010 Dance Company this coming year and to not dance with the Graham Company. Um, and I'm excited to see what happens, but I'm also very sad to be leaving behind that Graham technique and the Graham repertory. Um, 90 Chen will actually be talking here later this summer. She's our I third speaker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she'll talk about her fusion of Chinese classical dance with modern dance. Yeah. So we're excited to have her. Thanks to Kara, actually. So we're, we're very glad. So dance is a young person's career, and every dancer has to think about what they're going to do after dance. Have you thought about <laughs> what you're going to do when your dance career comes to an end? Yes. Um, 
Do we want to watch the 9010 video yes, first? Yes, I think we should watch 90 and then we'll come to that question. Sorry, you're right. Let me get off the subject. All right, so is this the last one? This is the last okay. video. Um, we've got a piece called Incense, which is one of my personal 90 favorites. Um, she was inspired by the incense curling into the air at any sort of ritual or offering. Um, the second clip is very, very short. It's just the beginning of a piece called Path, um, which is more abstract. And then the last piece is performed with live music, um, beautiful, beautiful live music by the On Trio, which is a trio of Korean sisters. Um, they do cello, violin, and piano. And the piece is called Concrete Stream. Um, so it uses the element of water. There's actually a bucket of water on stage that we use at that point, and it's a very lyrical piece. So yeah, three different excerpts.
just trying to enjoy what time I do have with dance. But I think that I will probably not stay with dance my entire life. Um, I want to use that second degree that I worked so hard to get. Um, I've always sort of cherished some sort of thoughts of being an English teacher. Um, <laughs> like maybe a high school level, level or something. Um, a lot of the most influential teachers that I had were my high school English teachers, so maybe that has something to do with it. But um, again, very vague, undefined plans, but I do think that I will not be staying in the dance world forever. Um, of course, I want to squeeze as much out of it as I can while I can, but there are transition <laughs> plans. <laughs> for some point in the future. <laughs> well, we wish you the best. Thank and you. Thank you so much for coming up from New York today on the train thank to do this. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm going to open this up for questions in case anyone would like to ask Kara any questions. Jerry. I have one question. Um, you mentioned at the end you came back to your double major, but I wondered that when you were an active performer, uh, was there ever a time, probably not when you were involved in the, in the actual dancing, but maybe thinking about what you were doing, where you made a connection between what you were doing as a dancer and the ideas you had explored, maybe in essays, in comparative literature? Oh, yeah. I mean, especially with something like the Grant Company, um, there are so many different disciplines at play. It's not just the physicality of the movement. Um, I mean, Graham herself used and pulled from so many different ideas in um, psychology and architecture and philosophy. Um, and I mean, there's still a lot of room for exploring all of that while you're working on her ballets, um, especially the architecture thing. I think one of the things that drew me the most to modern dance and also challenged me the most about modern dance that it's such an architectural dance form. Um, I think I mentioned like way back in the beginning of this that um, dance was always about movement for me instead of like making shapes, but I had to learn the hard way how to make shapes. Um, like those grand videos, you can see the spacing is so exacting. Um, she's really carving the space with both the body and with the conglomeration of bodies in a work. Um, and sort of like rewiring my brain to think that way, to use ideas of architecture. Um, and again, like there's a lot of psychology in dance, so much psychology. Um, but it really augments performance to think that way, to draw on. I mean, I find myself going back to ideas of like, I don't know, Merleau-Ponty or Derrida um, and using them in my performance. So there's definitely a lot of room for connections and I've definitely used those connections. Thanks. <clears throat> I should think the competition to get into the grade two company would be about as keen as it is to get into the number one company. So how much difference is there between the two companies? I should think it would be right. minuscule. I'm wondering whether that is the case. And what is the difference? Is it in the ability or is it in things like body type or something else? That's a difficult question. Um, body type comes into play more than I want to admit that it does. I think, um, especially in today's Graham company. Um, when you think back to when Martha Graham was forming her company in like the 20s and 30s, you see those videos and the girls all have you know varying body types. Um, but in, I would say around the 70s and 80s, ballet started having a big influence on Graham's work. Um, both because the dancers she started using came from ballet training and because she herself started collaborating with, you know, like Balanchine and Baryshnikov and others. Um, so ballet started to have a bigger influence on her company and her technique. And um, of course, throughout the decades, the competition to have better and better technique kept growing as well. So these days, I would definitely say that body type and the training you put your body through to have a specific body type come into play when differentiating between something like the first company and the second company. Um, but also, I mean, so much of dance is mental also, so you really just, 
you have to have all of the mental components of a first company dancer as well, which I would, I would say require more dedication, more mental drive, even maybe a little more ambition. Like I definitely had um, a friend in the second company with me who was a beautiful dancer, but he just didn't want it enough, you know? Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Were yeah. you part of the creation process with the Mani Chen company for these works that we saw, or is it something that was already in the rep? Right, the so the ones that were on there today were already in the rep. Um, she did, she does try and make new work every year. Um, this year I was not able to be involved in it because of the time constraints on my schedule. So I was just in programs that had already been <coughs> set over the previous, I think the newest piece on there was maybe two years old, two or three years old. So that's going to be a new experience for you to work with a new yeah, choreographer. I'm really that's excited great. for that, yeah. Because yeah. I got a little bit of that in college, but I yeah. mean, it's always such a different way of using your mind when yeah. you're in that creation process. So I'm really excited for that, yeah. So are you interested in choreography at all? Is that something that, because <laughs> some dancers yes. have no interest. Right. Um, so, like Gretchen mentioned, um, we were required to take choreography classes in college, mm -hmm. and I was always interested in it, or at least in the concept of it, but I think I figured out during those classes that um, it's too much for my brain. Like, um, I think because my brain gets pulled into all of that, I was talking before about like, you know, making connections and everything. Um, and it's really hard for me. I actually, one of my high school English teachers that was so amazing here at Falmouth High School told me once that I have a hard time seeing the forest for the trees. Um, so I, I pick out too many trees. I can't put together the forest of the trees. I'm too focused on like this tree here. <laughs> so yeah, um, I would love to be able to choreograph, but I have not found that yet. Maybe someday in the future, but for now, not for me. Uh, you said, of course, it was challenging mentally and physically. But what would you say grounded you mentally? What grounded me mentally? And how did you deal with the stress? Right. Um, yeah, it could get really stressful at points, um, especially in the Graham Company, where, as I mentioned, they're very old school, and the way they treat you is very old school sometimes. Um, what does that mean? Not so well. I can give an example or two. Um, so our rehearsal director for the Graham Company, her name is Denise Vale. Um, she is a hurricane of a woman. I mean, <laughs> she has the capacity for great love. Like she's, she gives the best hugs in the world. Mm -hmm. But she also has the capacity to be very, very brutal. Um, she once told me. I remember this was during the Primitive Mysteries rehearsal process, so I was very new to the company, very new to all this. And she said like, things like, well, either you're stupid or you just don't get it. <laughs> just like something like, you're, just, you're really starting to irritate me. And these are just things that you, you can't answer back. You can't, you can't cry. You just deal with it. Um, so I think sort of it was a learning process for me to learn to deal with that stress. Um, but again, if you want it enough, you deal with it. Um, definitely having my second job always grounded me. Like it was a place I could go to after rehearsal, and you know, like a safe place where no one was going to tell me that I was stupid. <laughs> it's a bit like Marine boot camp. Yeah. You know, it's a good in, in certain companies with certain directors, I think with the whole. Um, current Me Too movement and uh, strong uh, women coming out and saying that they needed to be treated more respectfully. I think gradually that's beginning to change, but it's uh, been for a long time, a very long time, that the situation in rehearsal and class was pretty abusive. Yeah, sometimes even physically abusive, uh, <coughs> but definitely yeah. verbally abusive. And you just were told to take it. And 
I've seen so many dancers leave the studio in tears. So you, you learn to be hard skinned and it also produces a, a tremendous kind of feeling of camaraderie and mutual support in a company because everybody will come together to, to shore up somebody who's been abused in rehearsal. And there are numerous stories. I mean, it, it all came out in the press in the last couple of years about what had gone on in New York City Ballet for years and years and years. And interestingly enough, that was never true with Mr. Balanchine. Mr. Balanchine was an extremely polite gentleman, but many of the people that worked with him were not, <laughs> including the person who took over for him. So dancers get hard skin. You know, I, I, rem I remember going home in tears, but after a while, it's just part of the deal, and you run to your friends for support. And if you're wise, you cultivate a good life outside of that very um, insular company life, too, to give a little balance in your life. I think that's really important, is to find balance in your life so your life isn't just dance. So Kara is a prime example of somebody who's found balance in her life through her love of literature and work outside. So. That's the advice I would give you if you're <laughs> heading in that direction. <laughs> have a well-rounded life in addition to your dance. Because there will be some rough moments in your dance. It's supposed to make you tough so that you can go on stage and deal with the ultimate humiliation, which is making a terrible mistake on stage or falling down on stage. You know, that, that's far worse than somebody calling you stupid in rehearsal. So I guess... No, that's the mentality behind that. I would but say yeah. I, I would say some dancers have that, and some just don't, they, don't. They, they won't. And having known Kara mm -hmm. for a very long time, I would I from the beginning said she will be a dancer. Yeah, mm -hmm. she mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. humble, never complained, even when it was tough. You know, you know they don't break down. I'm sure you did at times at home and whatnot. But you, and you have to be tough. You have to be tough. The ability yeah. to yeah. accept the inevitable little failures that happen. There's no such thing as the perfect performance. Maybe somebody else didn't see it, but you knew that you didn't do that as well as you did in rehearsal. And that's a hard thing to be forgiving with yourself and to, you know, be Scarlett O'Hara and say tomorrow's another day. Uh, but you have to. Unless you have that mentality, you'll just become a basket case. So <laughs> it's a certain kind of very courageous person it takes to go on stage and face failure. Because there are lots of little ones, right? All, oh, yeah. Always. Yeah. Gretchen, for those of you who have never seen the red shoes of any person alive, is still that's a personification of a dancer and manipulation and what a dancer gives up for the life of a dancer. It's about a ballet dancer, not a modern dancer. And I'm sure you've seen seen the film, but I actually have not. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go, well, go to home now. tonight and watch yeah. it. <laughs> but I I think that. For those of us in the profession, whether we're dancers or what, like Gretchen and I, working out the ways, um, the rewards of being in a special place with special people are overcoming the else. Most definitely. But but the abuse in the studio has never been proven to, you know, produce better dancers or right. performance. No. There is there are other ways to treat dancers, and I think. And I think it's good that it's been yeah. talked about and that, you know, that dancers for a very long time were treated like children and they're young men and women. So that I think today they demand a little more respect and I think that's good. They deserve it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Anyone else? We should take one last question and then we're out of here. Good. Thanks very much for coming.